Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is Dr. Ahmed. At first, today we are going to do the IGCSE paper, physics paper, May June 2020, paper four times on one. Okay. First question: An airplane of mass 2.5 times 3.5 lands with a speed of 62 meters per second on a horizontal runway. Okay. At the time t equals zero, that means this is u, okay? This is the speed u. The airplane decelerates uniformly, okay? As it travel along the runway and, okay, in a straight life, uh, uh, line until the speed reach of speed of, this is v, six meters per second, and how long? 35 watt seconds. A, calculate. Now, they ask about the deceleration. Now, we don't have formula for deceleration. We have formula for acceleration. And acceleration is the rate of changing speed, which is V minus U divided by T. So that means I'll get a negative answer. And our negative answer for the acceleration is deceleration. So what is V? The V is 6 minus the U, which is 62, divided by the time, which is 35. And the answer will be negative 1.6. I'll put it here as positive 1.6 meters per second watt square. Good. Okay. Now, this is the first part of the question. They ask about the deceleration of the uniform deceleration of this airplane. Double I, the resultant force acting on the airplane as it decelerates. Now, we know that the resultant force is equal to mass multiplied by what? By the acceleration, which is negative. That means this force is reducing force, slowing down. Yes, thank you, Ahlan uh, Saif, Ahlan Muhammad. Okay. Put negative on the power. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, this is for the A level. Meters per second, what? Square. So the resultant force, which is the mass, 2.5, multiply by 10 to the power of five, multiply by the acceleration or the deceleration, 1.6. And by using the calculator, it will be four times 10 to the power of five watt Newton. And this force in the opposite direction of the motion, okay? This is the resultant force in the opposite word direction because it will slow it down. There is deceleration, opposite direction. So you can put the negative or you can not put the negative because they didn't ask about direction. So it's four, times the power of negative, uh, to, four times the power of five Newton. Then they said, triple I, the momentum, okay, of the airplane when its speed is six meters per second. Now we know that momentum, okay, is equal to mass multiplied by speed or velocity. And the mass, which is 2.5 times the power of five, multiply by the velocity, which is six, okay, at six meters per second. That means the momentum will be 1.5 times 10 to the power of six kilogram dot meter per second. Or you can write Newton dot second because the unit of momentum is the same as unit of impulse. So far we get six marks, easy marks about, we can use the formula for acceleration equal result uh, v minus u over t resultant force equal mass times acceleration and momentum equal m times v so knowing the formulas can get you easy marks this is part a of the question part b of the question what do they ask at time t equal 35 seconds so from beginning here when it lands with a speed of 62 meters per second it distress uniformly at until it reach how much six meters per second after 35 seconds. At time 35 seconds, the airplane stopped decelerating, okay, and move along the runway at constant speed of six meters per second for another, what, 15 seconds, plus the 35 seconds, that means the total time is 50 seconds. All the figures sketch the shape of the graph for the distance travel of the runway airplane along the runway, okay, with t equal zero to t equal 50, and not required to calculate the distance values. Okay, they ask about distance time graph without putting the distance, only drawing this. Now we know that since we are talking about deceleration, that means the speed changes, okay? So it will not be a straight line, it, it will be curve. And we have three different situations. Is it curve with a decreasing gradient A or a straight line B? I just say it's not correct. 
or C, it's curved with increasing gradient. Which one is for the distillation? For the distillation, yes. For the distillation, that means the gradient will be less. So that means the gradient here is, which is the speed is faster than the gradient here, which is because the distillation. So the answer is correct. The answer is A. Now let's draw how the shape of this looks like. Now it will be curve. Okay, like this, curve with decreasing speed, decreasing gradient. Then eventually it will be a straight line by ruler like this. Now, some of the answers that I saw before, okay, they draw it like this, then they make it curve like this. Don't do that. The gradient here remains constant before and after because the speed, they said it remains constant six. If I do that, that means the speed changes during this moment, the 35 seconds. So this is not correct. So it will be cur curve, okay, with decreasing gradient until it reaches the 35 seconds. Then it continues a straight line with the same gradient as it reaches it. This is three marks. If you did this mistake, for example, if you draw it like this with decreasing gradient, then here you draw it like this, okay, you lose mark, you get two out of three, okay? So we have to be careful, okay? We need H mark to, to have in the exam, inshallah, to get a full mark or A star, inshallah. Any question? Is it easy? Let's move on to the next part. Yes. Okay, now what they ask here. As the airplane distillates, the kinetic energy decreases. Yes, because the speed decreases, so the kinetic energy decreases. So just what happened to the energy? Yes, because there is a slowing down, that means that we are using brake or friction force, okay? So I'm not going to use forces, okay? What happened to the force? I'm talking about what happened to the energy. This is your energy is converted into what? Into heat and what thermal energy inside what an object here. For example, inside the brake, inside the tires, against air resistance, something like this, okay? So thermal energy to the tires, okay? Thermal energy to the tires. Okay, good. I can't say only, only uh, also uh, heat loss to the surrounding. I have to be more specific. What, is, what do I mean by the surrounding? Good. It's easy to mark question. Let's move on to the second question. Second question, it's obvious that it talks about Hox law. Okay, we have extension load graph, Hox there. The extension load graph for the, uh, uh, a light spring, S, okay? State the range of the load which it obeys Hock's law. Now, uh, Hock's law state the relationship between the force and the extension supposed to be directly proportional. So I'm going to look where the line, okay, it's not straight line anymore, and it's, yes, thank you, Marwan, it's finished. At this point, it becomes curve after it. So this is the limit of proportionality. So I can say from zero, for example, in Newton, to what? To eight in Newton. Okay, if I don't want to write it in this way, can I write it in terms of extension? Yes, of course. Or you can write it in, uh, for zero centimeter to what? To this point, which is exactly 15 what centimeter. Or you can write it in both ways. Good. Thank you, Marwan. Thank you, Muhammad. Any other questions? Is it clear? Okay. Next part here, okay. Use information from the figure, determine the spring constant. Now we know that according to the formula, force equals spring constant multiplied by the extension. Now the force that we just find it out, which is 50, okay, which is 80 Newton, is equal to the spring constant multiplied by what? Multiplied by the extension, which we say that it's 15, what, centimeters. So divide by 15 centimeters, divide by 15 centimeters, so K, it will be equal 8 over 15. And the answer, it will be 0 0.5333, etc. So we can write it in two significant figures, 0.53 Newton per centimeter. Shall I convert it from centimeter to meter? No, it's not necessary. But if we did this, if we say that the force equals the spring constant multiplied by the extension, which is 0 0.15, okay, and the value of K, it would be uh, 
newton per meter so both answers are accepted in the mark scheme okay if you convert it from centimeter to meter or you keep it in centimeter good any question take a screenshot if you please let's move on to next part part c of the question in part c a second spring identical to the first spring s okay so these two springs are identical okay similar to s okay are attached to the spring okay the spring are attached to the uh, low uh, rod okay and uh, the figure two point as shown here the figure a load of four newton okay suspended from the bottom of the spring the arrangement are in equilibrium okay doesn't uh, oscillate or vibrate okay so yes thank you Marwan. one state the name of the form of energy stored inside the spring now we have to know that the energy stored in the spring exactly is a strain energy or elastic potential energy elastic potential energy you can write also what strain energy okay double i what they ask determine the extension of the arrangement now how we can find the extension we need to return back to uh, to the graph and we will see that the extension at four centimeter it will be how many at, at so for you sorry at four newton it will be 7.5 centimeter so since we have two springs okay that means each spring will extend by 7.5 by 2 because we have two identical springs that are attached in series so each spring will be extended by the same load by 7.5 by 7.5 so the total extension will be 50 and they give us the unit what centimeter okay next triple i the load is carefully increased to how much? Six in Newton in total, okay? Calculate the distance moved by the load to the new equilibrium position when the load increased from four to six in Newton. Let's return back here to the six in Newton. Now, here in six in Newton, it's not clear what is the point of dimension, but it's approximately 11.25, okay? You can use Hawke's law to, to be sure about the values okay so what we can say here we can say that in this situation that the uh, at six newton the extension was equal to 11.25 okay centimeter that means okay the for the both extension okay for both i'll multiply it by two 11.25 multiplied by two which is uh, uh 22.5 centimeter now i need to find the difference here because they ask about the difference in what in the length so it was 15 okay and becomes what 22 so the change and the extension that they ask about it is 22.5 minus 15 which is 7.5 centimeter okay this is the difference in the extension when it change from okay the distance moved okay from four to six centimeter this is the distance moved with which, which is the change in what and the this in the extension for both situations any question is it clear okay let's move on to question number three as usual we have three questions about general physics one or two questions about uh, thermal physics one or two questions about waves three questions about electricity magnetism electrical components logic gates and one question about nuclear physics that's usually what happens okay question number three the figure shows uh, uh shows gas trapped in what uh, a sealed end of a tube of a dense liquid this is the trapped gas okay now the scale marked on the sealed end okay, of the tube calibrated to read the volume of the gas trapped above what the liquid surface, okay? Show that the initial volume V1 is what? 60 centimeter cube. The pressure of the atmosphere is one times the power of five Pascal. Now, we know that this is open. That means the atmospheric pressure act on this point. And these two points, they have same level. 
So they have the same what pressure, atmospheric pressure and atmospheric pressure. That means the trapped gas here has what atmospheric pressure. Okay. State how the uh, okay how how the figure shows that the pressure of the trapped air is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere. What we're going to say because both what yes both sides have same level exactly both sides have what same level okay so you can say that both of them they have to be equilibrium okay or they have to be equal the height and in, in the of the pressure inside okay good part b explain in terms of momentum of the molecules why the trapped gas exert a pressure okay on the walls of the tube now we know we have to know that when they say when they ask about that this question three or four marks question we have to talk about that the the, the gas molecules okay keep what moving and keep hitting each other and as they collide each other they they change their momentum and as they hit and bounce they change their momentum that means this change in momentum causing impulse and force and the uh, total molecules as they hit certain surface area and bounce they cause a force on its area that means this force over area which causes what the pressure okay so what are I going to say as the gas molecules keep moving at high speed and collide to each other and to the walls they change They change their momentum as they bounce causing impulse and force on the walls so many molecules acting by a force or causing force on certain area causing pressure so that's how we can answer these type of questions by telling them that there's change in momentum and they as they hit and bounce they change their momentum and this momentum change they cause impulse and force and this force spreads out in a certain area causing what pressure Thank you for your answers. Take a screenshot. Next part, part C. In part C, what they say, more of the dense liquid is added, okay? Okay, is poured into the open, okay, end of the tube. We've add uh, more than 15 centimeter, okay? As a height, okay? The liquid on both seeds are, okay, are open and, on one side and arises on the other side, the temperature of the trapped gas, okay, and the atmospheric pressure, all of them remains constant. So they have, we have same atmospheric pressure and we have the same temperature, so we didn't change this. Now, when they say that the temperature is constant, they get, give us a hint about the formula that they ask about it. Look here what they ask. In the sealed end of the tube, the volume V2 is how much now? It was 60 centimeter cube, now it's 50 centimeter cube. In the open, okay, uh, in the open end of the tube, the liquid surface increased by 15 watt centimeter to the new watt position as they are 
see the tube, okay? Calculate the pressure P2 of the trapped air. Now, this formula, we know that it's equal P1, P V1, equal P2, V2, okay? Because they tell us that the pressure is remains constant and they give us the first volume and the second volume and they ask about the second volume, the second pressure. So the pressure of the first situation, which is one times 10 to the power of five, the, the atmospheric pressure, multiplied by the first volume, which was 60 centimeter cube, keep it in, some, in centimeter cube, equal P2, which the one that we want to find it out, multiply by 50, divide by 50, divide by 50. So the answer would be 1.5, 1.2, sorry, times 10 to the power of five Pascal. Okay, yes. This is how we are going to answer the question, not using pressure equal force over area. I'm, uh, I don't have neither force or area in this situation here, okay? I have the first pressure in the first situation, which was atmospheric pressure. I have the first volume, which was 60 centimeter cube. Now the new volume, it becomes 50. So that means the pressure will be increased for the trapped air to be 1.2 times 10 to the power of five. Double I, calculate the liquid density of the tube. Now, we know that the pressure now is increased by how much? It's increased by 0 0.2. Now, that's changing the pressure. Okay. It's changing the pressure of the gas is equal the pressure of the liquid, which is equal density times gravity times height. So the change of the pressure, which is 1.2, 1.2 minus one multiplied by 10 to the power of five, the difference of the pressure is, is caused what? On the trap gas is caused by the liquid. So we have to know that the liquid density times gravity acceleration, which is 10 times 15 centimeter, which is 0 0.15. Okay, we have to convert it from centimeter to meter in the situation we have to, okay, in this formula. So dividing by uh, 1.5, so the, the density, it will be how much? approximately 1.3 times 10 to the power of four kilogram per cubic meter. Good. Any question? Okay, eight marks about pressure. Okay, which is easy so far. We finish the first three questions that usually talk about general physics. Now, question number four, they ask about what thermal physics here. Now, as you can see, water has a specific heat capacity of 4,200 joule per kilogram degree Celsius. This is a specific heat capacity. And boils at 100 degrees Celsius. We have to know this information. State what is meant by boiling point. I remember in my courses, I told my students to write down a word, okay? Muhammad, you didn't write the word Marwan, you didn't write the word. Who can tell me what is the word that I will start the definition of the boiling point? It's what? Exactly, your answers are correct, but you will not get the mark. The what, what's the word, huh? What's the word, I'll write it with different color. The, no, no. The temperature, the temperature at which the liquid is converted into gas. The liquid is turned into gas. Into gas. In my courses, I put the word temperature. I remember this. So it's not a point, it's a temperature. We have to be more specified here. Okay? Thank you, Adham. Thank you, Muhammad. Okay. So this is part A of the question, one mark. Part B, a mass of 0 0.3 kilogram of water at boiling temperature, okay, at boiling point, so this is the mass, okay, is poured into a copper container, which has initial, uh, uh, the temperature of it is 11 degrees Celsius. So the water, this is the mass of the water, okay, the mass of the water, which is 0 0.3, the initial temperature of the water, okay, which is 100 degrees Celsius, we have initial temperature of the copper, which is 11 degrees Celsius, okay? And after a few seconds, the temperature of the container, that means the final temperature for both the ice, uh, sorry, the water and the copper is how much? 95 degrees, 95 degrees Celsius, okay? I, calculate the energy transfer from water. 
that means the energy that lost by the water and gained to whom? To the copper. So that means the energy lost, okay, equal mc delta t. So the mass, which is 0 0.3, multiplied by the specific heat capacity, which is 4,200, multiplied by the change of temperature, which is how much? 100 minus 95, okay? The change in temperature, okay, can we write it 95 minus, um, 95 minus 100? Yes, it will be, the answer to be negative. And this answer is negative, that means it lost this amount of energy, which is 6,300 joules, okay? This is the amount of energy lost by the water and gained by whom? Gained by the copper, okay? Calculate the, the thermal capacity of the copper container. Now we know that thermal capacity of the copper container, we can find it in two different ways. So the thermal capacity can be used by the formula. Uh, uh, energy is equal thermal capacity times change in temperature, change in temperature, or you can say the thermal capacity equal mass multiplied by specific heat capacity of the copper. So I don't know how much is the specific heat capacity of the copper, but I know how much the mass of it. So I cannot use this formula, okay? This formula, I can't use it now. That means I will use the original formula, okay? That the amount of energy lost by the water, we'll just find it out, 6,300, okay? Equal the thermal capacity of the copper, multiply by the change of its temperature and the temperature change, 95 minus 11. And by using calculator, it will be, 75 joules per degree Celsius. This is the thermal capacity. Good. Any question? Next. Triple I. Water from the container evaporates and the energy of the remaining water decreases slowly, okay? Explain in terms of molecules, why evaporation causes the temperature, okay, of the remaining water to be less or to decrease. Now, we said that we have three main ways to lose energy or transfer heat, conduction, convection, radiation. And one of the ways which is special for liquids, it's that to lose energy are the evaporation. So now when, when water, it's not at boiling point now, it's the uh, 95 degrees Celsius. So that means exactly the most, thank you, Muhammad, the most energetic molecules at the surface of the liquid, they need this energy to what? To break the bonds and uh, separate and leave the what? From to be gas, not be liquid anymore. So this energy is taken from what? From the water. So the, and the most energetic molecules they leave, that means the remaining molecules have low energy and low speed, so the temperature becomes what? Lower, okay? So if I want to, yes, thank you, uh, Mohammed. So, okay, and thank you, Marwan. So what I'm going to write, energy is needed to do, to do work against Uh, molecules to break the bonds and evaporate so the most energetic molecules the most energetic molecules, okay, will leave the liquid surface making the remaining molecules the remaining molecules have less 
average uh, what average energy and temperature good now when you say that the rate of uh, the rate of more successful collision increase, that's something else here. We are not talking about gas molecules here. So we have to be more specific about liquid molecules, okay? Take a screenshot, write this down. Any question? Okay. Let's move on to the next part. Question number five. It talks about waves here. The distance between the center of a thin converging lens to each of the focus point, okay, the principal focus, okay, the focal length called is how much? Five centimeter. A, describe what is meant by the term principal focus for the thin converging lens. Now, the, the uh, thin, uh, the principal focus is the point where the parallel rays, okay, parallel to the principal axis, they meet and they what they uh, uh, converge at this point. That's why they call this point converging, this lens converging lens, or this point focus point. Now, uh, one of the questions that no, it's not necessary to mention anything about uh, the rate of collisions of the molecules now. No, okay, in that part because we didn't mention anything about the pressure here. Yeah, of course, the rate of collision they will decrease here, but they didn't mention why. I need this. Okay, they ask about why the temperature decrease. So eventually, yes, the collisions will increase, but this is not the answer for what they ask. So the point, the point on the principal axis. The point, point on the principal axis where the incident parallel rays are refract and from the lens. and meet at it, meet at it. This is the definition of the principal focus. Two marks, yes. Next part, B, the lens is used as magnifying glass. Magnifying means getting bigger, okay? And this is the case number six for converging lens when the object is too close, closer than the focus point, okay? Now, the lens, okay, is used as magnifying glass, okay, to produce an image eye for an object O. Underline the terms that describe the nature of the image producing the magnifying glass. Now we have to name, no, yes, exactly. It's enlarged, bigger, okay? It's, since it is magnifying glass, that means it will be in uh, what? Yes, exactly. It will be virtual and it will be what? Upright. Yes, thank you. So it will be upright, not inverted, okay? Because we are not talking about real image, virtual image, and it will be enlarged. Double I, the figure, okay, the figure 5.1 is the full scale diagram of the lens of the image I, okay? They draw the image. And they will ask us to draw what the object eye. Look what they ask here. On the figure, mark the both principal focuses, okay, the, and label each of the term F, okay, by drawing on F, okay, on the figure, okay, find the position of the object O and add O on the diagram. Now they give us the scale, which is one centimeter here and one centimeter here. That's why I'm going to go to this type of uh, applications here, okay, that I can draw a straight line on it. Okay, look what they ask here. So it's one centimeter, okay, one point two three four one centimeter, 
one, two, three, four, five, one, another centimeter. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, another centimeter, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's the focus point, the first one, which is here. This is the focus point, and I will do the same thing on the other side, which is the other focus point. Okay. Yes. So. Now in the external, it will be more clear what, where are the paper, where are the points, more than uh, the drawing that I have it now. So this is the other what focus point, it's here, okay. These are the two focus, focus points, okay. And now we need to draw what the image. Now we know that the object, it will be somewhere here, okay, because we know that Okay, somewhere here. We know that the rays come from what? Come from the object to the lens, okay? And their extension is reached to be the image, to form the image. So I will draw a line which pass through this optical center like this. Okay, this is the first ray, okay? And I will draw what? Another ray that pass to what? To the uh, parallel to this uh, like this and then pass through the focus no i'm not going to draw like this now my object okay it will be somewhere here that form what the image now hold on what do i did here okay this is what this is the first ray now my object it will be somewhere like this so the second ray it will refract from the lens passing through the second focus point something like this Okay, let me fix it, okay, by ruler. Now, this ray, okay, it's supposed to reach where? It's supposed to reach, oh, I'm sorry, like this. It's supposed to reach the focus point and continue like this, but actually it come parallel to the, from the principal axis when it reach what the, the, what the lens. So this is the position of what, of my object. Hold on. This is the position of my object somewhere here. Okay. And this is the object. I label this point as O. Okay. That's how these are two rays. One ray pass through the center, keep moving. Their extension go backward. And one parallel to the principal axis pass through the principal focus and its extension go back. So this is the origin, the position of the object O. Any question? Is it clear? From exactly from the center of the lens. Exactly, I will draw the parallel to the principal line, the straight line ray, ray. Good. Okay, let's return back to the page here, the question. Use the figure to determine the distance okay, of the object or from the center of the lens. Now we we'll return back here. I will use my ruler. Okay, and okay, sorry, the scale here, which is one centimeter, two centimeter, exactly three centimeter. This is how far is what is my object. So it will be 3.0 what centimeter. Exactly, thank you, Marwan. Yes, it's exactly three centimeter or 2.8 or 2.9. It depends on your drawing, how accurate you are. Okay, good. This is nine marks question, it's easy. Let's move on to answer other questions. Question number six, what do they ask? They ask about sound and waves. We still talk about waves. What do they say here? The speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second. Calculate the range of the wavelengths for the sound that are uh, audible for human hearing. Now, we know that they ask about the wavelength. Now, they didn't ask about the human hearing. The human hearing, it's between 20 hertz to what? To 20,000 hertz. These are the frequency that we can hear it, okay? But they didn't ask about the frequency. They ask about the wavelength. That means I will find the wavelength for each of these what frequencies. So I'll write down that V equal 
f lambda so that means the wavelength equal v over the frequency i'll do this twice one for the 20 hertz and one for the 20000 hertz so that means the wavelength okay uh, it's 340 divided by 20 okay which is 1.7 meter okay to, and the other one i will repeat this and 340 divided by 20000 hertz and the answer will be 0. 0017 meter or you can write it in order to make the smaller in the beginning and the okay so for example 0 0.017 meter this is the shortest wavelength that we can hear it and this will be the longest wavelength that we can hear at 1.7 meter long good yes it's from 20 to 20 thousand hertz next Sound waves are longitudinal waves. Okay, describe how longitudinal, okay, are different from transverse. There are three marks. There have been discussions several times. One, sometimes it was only one mark, other times two or three marks like this. So we can say that longitudinal, longitudinal, longitudinal. waves, it's, os uh, os uh, oh, it's uh, the oscillation of it, oscillates parallel to what? Parallel to the direction of the wave propagation. while transverse while transverse oscillate parallel yeah, sorry uh, perpendicular And longitudinal has compressions and rare fractions and rare fractions. Rare fractions. While transverse has crest and truss. While transverse has crests and troughs. Good. So we mentioned all the ideas that compare between longitudinal and transverse to, to get the three marks. That's part B of the question. In part C, what they said here, part C. The figure shows the band in front of a building. We have a band in front of the building. The drum produce a low frequency. The drum produce a low frequency sound. The other musical instrument produces high frequency sound. These sounds are equally loud, okay? So we are talking about different frequency, different pitch here, okay? And different wavelength, of course. A young man, okay, is uh, uh, at the side of the building, hears the drum, okay? But not as, okay, the high frequency sounds, only hear the drum, which is, has low frequency, not the high frequency, okay? Explain why this happens. Now we know that both waves, okay, the drum, okay, this one has a long wavelength because it has low frequency, it has long wavelength, okay, so as it reach 
the edge of the of the uh, of the building it's what it diffracts it passed through so it was going like this it's going like this now it diffracts why the other frequencies uh, that has high frequency like these musical instrument okay they have very low frequency so they don't diffract that much okay as they pass okay they diffract a little bit not as the drum so if i want to answer this one i uh, this question i have to mention something about what about diffraction that for the low frequency which is has a high a long wavelength okay that this long wave is greater than the gap of the edge of the barrier okay of the building so it can diffract more than the one that has short what wavelength that's uh, like the musical instrument with high what frequency drum has longer longer wavelength than the other musical instrument the other musical instrument so so it diffracts more so it diffracts more around around the edge of the building than shorter wavelengths wavelength sound sounds good is it clear any question thank you Muhammad. now let's move on to Question number seven. Question number seven talks about uh, magnetism here. What they ask here. Question seven. An, an electromagnet consists of a solenoid X that is made by a copper wire, okay? The solenoid con uh, contains an iron core, okay? Like this, but they didn't mention the picture here. A, explain why I, the structure of copper, makes it suitable material for the wire. Why it's a suitable material for a wire? Copper is a metal. That means it contains high number of free electrons or low number, low number of free electrons. High number of free electrons. So it is a good conductor or not a good conductor? Yes, it is a good conductor. So we can write, yes, we can write copper is a metal which has high number of free electrons. So it is a good conductor, a good conductor for electricity. That's about the copper. Next. Why iron is a suitable material for the electro, uh, electromagnet, for the core of the electromagnet? Now, we know that it's a ferrous material that is what temporary magnetized, right? Yes, the iron is ferrous material that is temporary magnetized, so it can be easily magnetized and easily what demagnetized. It is a soft ferrous material which temporary magnetize 
magnetized. So it is easy, easily, oh, it is easy to be magnetized and easy to be demagnetized. Magnetize, I forget to write the N. And easy to demagnetize. Okay. No, uh, steel is a hard, a hard um, uh, ferrous material. But iron is soft ferrous material. I'm not talking about hard as strong, okay, strength of it as we are going to, you are going to study it later on as something called uh, young mudras. No, I'm not talking about the hardness, how strong or weak it is. I'm talking about how hard or soft according to ferrous materials, ferrous magnetic materials, okay? Next. Part B, what they ask. The figure shows an electromagnet inside a second, okay, a second solenoid Y. So we have, uh, as you can see, an AC power supply, terminus Y. Okay, we have a solenoid X and we have what? A solenoid Y. The figure shows an electromagnet inside a second well, solenoid Y. Okay, like this. I, describe and explain what happens to the solenoid Y. Okay. When solenoid X, the one which is a smaller here, okay, it is connected to an alternating current AC power supply. Now, as AC, alternating current, passes, that means the current keeps changing its direction, passing through the solenoid. And this current, as it passes through the solenoid, as we study in uh, electromagnetic induction, it will produce and induce what magnet. And this magnet or magnetic field, okay, it will be changeable magnetic field. So it keep moving forward, backwards, okay, from uh, uh, to the right, to the left, okay, through the solenoid X. And since solenoid Y, okay, it's uh, around it, that means we have change of the magnetic flux or there's continuous cutting of magnetic field lines at changeable rate and changeable direction. This will produce an induced EMF across the terminals of the coil. That means there will be an induced alternating current pass through what? Through the whole circuit. So if I want to write this answer, which is, it will be long, I'll write to write, uh, to write all the informations about, okay, about this. As the AC passes X, okay, a changeable, Magnetic field, don't write MF in the exam, okay, write magnetic field. A changeable magnetic field is produced inside it and inside Y. So there's change of the magnetic flux inside solenoid Y, which produces, which produces and induced alternating EMF across it. So, an induced AC will pass through it, through 
that. Good. Clear? Any question? Double I. A switch, okay, a switch and a lamp are connected. Can I repeat it? Okay, I will repeat it. Now, we have to know that this is uh, the work of the transformer, okay? We have primary coil and secondary coil. We have input power supply and output voltage, okay? So when the input current pass, <coughs> So this solenoid happened, huh? there will be a magnetic field that happens in the core, okay, inside it. That means, and this is, that means the magnetic field it will keep changing since it's alternating currents. That means the current keep changing uh, upward or downward or right and left. So the changeable magnetic field, okay, keep moving, okay, forward and backward, okay. That means there will be change of the magnetic flux inside the primary coil of what of what the, the big wire here which is solenoid Y. So when there is change of the magnetic flux, that means there is cutting of magnetic feed lines. So when there is cutting, uh, continuous cutting, and this continuous cutting change, sometimes like the magnet going forward, other times we move the magnet away, okay? So this continuous movement that causes continuous cutting of magnetic feed lines produces an induced EMF across it, okay? From here to here. And this induced EMF, okay? cause a current to pass. And this current is AC, not DC, because this alternating EMF that produced because of the change of the magnetic flux. Is it clear? Did I answer your question now? Safe? Okay, you are welcome. Double I, a switch, a switch and a lamp are connected in series, okay, with the terminals of the solenoid Y. So here, we have what connect a switch and a lamp, okay? With the terminals of the solenoid Y. When this, okay, when the uh, when the switch is closed, when the switch is closed, okay, the lamp, okay, light up at normal what brightness, okay? Describe and explain what happens to the current in the solenoid X, the main solenoid that has an AC, Okay, as this, uh, okay, when the switch is closed. Now, some of the books, they wrote something called eddy current, okay? So now actually we have an induced EMF, okay, in the first part I, okay? We have induced EMF here. But this induced EMF does not have a current, okay? to pass, okay, through the whole circuit, okay? Now, when we close this circuit here with a lamp, that means will be a complete circuit, that means will be a current. And this current keep what, what increasing, okay? This current keep what increasing, okay, as we close the switch. So by increasing the current, that means we have more, what, more induced EMF in the what, in the solenoid, okay? So that means, okay, uh, the lamp will be what will be on, okay, brighter, okay, in, in the beginning, okay, as we close it in the, the instant that we close it, okay. So, a current passes through Y causes increase. And uh, increase the current. Increase the current through X. Okay, that's what happened. Okay, as okay, as there's more. supply and EMF from Y or from the lab, okay? Good.
let's move on to the next question, question number eight. In question number eight, what do we have? The power supply used an electric uh, uh, vehicle contains 990 rechargeable cells. Each electromotive of it is how much? 1.2 volt, okay? The cells are contained in packs, okay? In which the cells are made in series to each other. The EMF of each pack is how much? 54 volt. Calculate the number of packs in the, pot, in the power supply. Now, we did say that we have the total number of what? Of, uh, uh, of cells, it's how much? 990. And the voltage for each pack, it's supposed to be 50 watt, 54. So that means the total number, which is 990, divided by what? The, uh, the, the number of, uh, uh, how much is the number for each pack, okay? Which is uh, 54 watt, 54 volt divided by 1.2 to know how much is the number of each pack. And the total number, it will be 22 packs. Again, we have several cells, okay? And each several cells, okay, they are connected to each other like this to get a total voltage from here to here of how much? 54, okay? Now, the total number of cells, okay, we have a lot of cells here, 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 okay? A lot of cells, okay? Uh, the total number of cells are 990. Now, I need to know how many cells in each pack, okay? which is 45, 50, sorry, 54 divided by 1.2. Then I divide the whole number, okay, of 990 divided by what this answer, and I will get that we have to 22 packs, okay, are in this, what, huge battery, okay? Tamam? Good? Okay. Next. When in use, each pack supplies a current of what? 5.3 ampere. We have the voltage, we have the current. What they ask? Calculate the rate at which the cell transfer chemical energy. The rate of energy, that means they are talking about what? About power into electrical energy. And we know that P equal IV, very important person. Okay? So the power, they ask about it, which is equal to the current, which is 3.2 Okay, calculate the rate at each cell, each cell. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Each cell, the voltage is 1.2 multiplied by the current, which is what, 3.5. That means the answer, it will be 4.2 watt. That's the transfer for each watt cell, not for the whole pack, okay? Double I, what do they ask here? The packs are connected in parallel to the supply, okay? A large current is drive through the electrical vehicle. Explain why if it is necessarily using thick wires to carry this current. Now, if we have thin wires, that means we have a huge what? Resistance. And thin wires that okay, high current pass through them, maybe their temperature will be high, okay? And as the temperature increase the, the, in the wires, maybe it will start a fire, okay? Or maybe it will start to melt, okay? Or uh, the insulation around it, okay? It will start to melt. Exactly, thank you, Marwan. So what do we need here? We need a thick wires that can carry this a huge current because they have what? Low resistance, okay? So thick wires, thick wires, have lower resistance. So this thermal energy is used to heat the wires. And less chance, and less chance 
to uh, uh, to uh, start a fire or to melt the insulation around the wires to melt the insulation around the wires good clear take screenshot or write <coughs> down the answers okay question number nine about logic gates it's obvious what they ask a describe how a digital signal okay different from analog signal you may draw a diagram now you may draw a diagram some students they don't know how to draw a diagram other students they know but actually okay if i have a, a diagram okay for example i can draw like this for example 3.15 volt okay this is digital or analog this is digital but if i have a screen of a voltmeter like this okay and i have what for example 0 1 okay 2 3 4 like this okay and they ask for this one which is 3.15 it will be something like this. This is analog and this is digital. So this is digital. And this is analog. What's the difference between these? Yes. I remember that we explained it during the course. What's the difference between these? Here, the reading changed by certain values. In the digital circuit, the reading changes by certain values. OK? Tamam? But for analog, OK, there is continuous changing of the reading. So the reading changes by certain value. But here, the analog, the reading changes continuously. Okay, here change by a certain value. For example, maybe it's 3.152, but it's written 1.5. Okay, so if we have range, the maximum value is 3.154, and the minimum value is 3.145, okay, and they put a 3.15, okay. But here it's continuous, and you can see that it decreases a little bit or increases a little bit from 3.15. That's why the reading continue, uh, changes continuously. Next, part B. And the appropriate boxes draw the symbol for AND gate and the symbol for OR gate. Now we have the symbol for AND gate, okay? Like Basit from uh, SpongeBob, okay? It has two eyes like this. We have two inputs. Okay, and we have one output like this. For the OR gate, we, has, we have curve, not straight line here. We have curve shapes, okay, and curve sides and sharp output like this. This is one output. And the, we have two what inputs. Okay, good. It's only one mark, yes. Double I, state how the behavior of AND gate different from the OR gate. Now we know that for AND gate to make the output high, both inputs supposed to be what high. But for the OR gate, if one or both inputs are high, the output is what is high, okay? For AND, it needs both inputs 
to be high to get high output but for or only one high input can make the output high. Easy. Next, C. C, an arrangement, okay, for the logic gates A, B, C, this is NAND, this is NOR, this is NOR, okay, is shown in the figure, okay. The arrangement has two inputs, X and Y, and two what outputs P and Q, okay. When output P of the logic gates B, okay, has a logic state one high, okay. Output P of logic gate B, okay, is stated high, this is high, okay, here, okay. I, determine the logic, uh, the state of the uh, two inputs of the logic gate B. Now, now we know that in NOR, okay, which is the opposite of OR, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, okay, if there is OR, that means it will be 0, 1, 1, 1. But if there is NOR here, that means the opposite, it will be 1, 0, 0, 0. So what will be the inputs for X and Y to get an output of high here? Who can tell you what's the, uh, the answer? It will be low, low for both of them, okay? Tamam? So it will be low, low, or you can write zero, zero. Okay? Double I, what they ask? Double I, determine and explain the logic state of what Q. Now we need to answer how, what will be, the output Q here, okay? Now we have to know that we have low here and low here, okay? That means it will be low here and low here and low and low, okay? It will be what? It will be also what? High, right? Right? So I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My mistake, my mistake, I'm sorry. The uh, both inputs here and here are zero, zero. So that makes what Y is zero, but for NAND, okay, to get zero, that means, okay, because uh, both inputs are the same, that means it will be what high. So high and, okay, that means this high is one, okay, and this is zero, zero here. So determine uh, what will be the output here, it will be what, it will be zero, so again, Determine, explain the logic gate of what Q. Now, uh, Y is zero, and X is the input of NAND that has an output zero, so x is high, or one, okay, making x, which is one, and y, which is zero, as they reach C to be to be what to be one or high because it's what it's not okay is it clear any question I know you are tired, yes, because of fasting, yes. 
Question number 10, last question in this paper about nuclear physics. Okay, what do they ask here? The figure 10.1 represent the neutral atom of an isotope of element X. Okay, this is the isotope for element X. State one sim uh, similarity between the atom and the neutral atom, okay, uh, of different isotopes. Now, this, since they said a neutral atom, that means they have same number because they are isotopes. They have same proton number, and you can say it since they said neutral atom, that means they have same number of electrons, but they ask about one of them. So one similarity, both have same what? Bravo, Shukram one. both have same number of protons. Or you can say also electrons. Okay? Or you can say uh, atomic number. They have same atomic number. Okay. This is part A of the question. Part B, okay, an isotope of element X is radioactive. It, it decays to form an isotope of element Y, this Y, okay, by emitting what? Beta particle. Use the figure, okay, 10.1 to deduce the nuclear notation of the isotope Y produced by this decay. Now look here, what do we have here? We have one, two, three, four, five, okay, five protons. And because we have five electrons, one, two, three, four, five. So the X has five here, okay. And we have also one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So where the total is what? Eight plus five, which is 13. This is the notation of element X before decaying what? Beta. Now, as it decays beta, and we all know that beta has negative one, zero, that means Y, okay, the, uh, the nuclear number in the top doesn't change, it remains 13, but the bottom number, okay, to add plus, uh, to add minus one, they have to make, make the, the atomic number to increase by one, so it will be six. So the answer here is six, what, 13. That's the equation for the uh, emitting beta from element X to be Y. Good. Thank you, Marwan. Thank you, Muhammad. Last part of the question here and of the whole exam. Beta particles, okay, ionize. Ionize the air as they pass through less stronger than the same number of alpha what particles. So we know that alpha is more, uh, has higher ionizing effect than what beta. So just why is this? Now we know that Beta has negative one charge, so less charge, but alpha has positive two, greater charge. We know that beta has a smaller mass, okay, while alpha has what bigger mass. Also, we, we know that beta has less energy due to the less mass, okay, while alpha has greater mass. Okay, and we know that beta travel faster, so it's not ionized that much as uh, alpha, which is travel what slower. Okay, slowly. Okay, so you can write uh, I don't, I, I, three marks. That means they I have to write a lot of things. Okay, can we write alpha contact more than beta? Okay, now the idea is not doesn't make contact. What do you mean by contact? Do you mean attraction more? Yes, because it has more charge. So you can write beta. Okay, particles have less. Okay, uh, mass than alpha. That's the first one. Second one, alpha particles have less charge than alpha. Number three, you can write that uh, beta particles have uh, 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 faster or have trouble faster, faster speed than alpha. You can write also beta particles have, okay, uh, less energy than alpha. And like this, we finish this here. 
If you have any question, you can stay online. If you don't have a question, you can leave. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa